Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Michele for, uh, for giving uh, the possibility to present the paper in uh, this webinar. And uh, I would also like to thank all the discussants for the interesting points raised in the discussion papers. Um, first of all, uh, so this, uh, in this talk, I will uh, discuss uh, Latin Death and Parametric Priors, uh, which uh, is a paper jointly written with David Danson, Antonio Lioi, Igor Brunster, and Rodriguez. Uh, so, this paper, um, so in this paper, we focused on uh, nested processes. And uh, I recall that the nested Dirichlet process is a very famous Bayesian and Parametric Prior to accommodate for uh, heterogeneous groups of observations. Uh, um, so in the first part of uh, the paper, we have uh, shown uh, the generacy issue of the nested Dirichlet process, uh, and uh, it typically degenerates, roughly speaking, it typically degenerates to a situation of uh, um, homogeneity across uh, the different samples. So um, it, it's not useful uh, to accommodate for heterogeneous groups of observations in, uh, in some real applications. Um, uh, in the first part of the paper, we have also shown that this degeneracy property holds true not only for the nested Dirichlet process, but uh, for all nested processes based on completely random measures. So in order to overcome this uh, drawback, this issue of the nested Dirichlet process, we have to introduce a novel vision of parametric prior. Uh, and we intro in the second part of the paper, we introduce these latent nested non-parametric priors in order to fix uh, the issue of the degeneracy property of the nested Dirichlet process. Um, so, um, mm, so this is the outline of the presentation. I will begin with an introduction to exchangeability and partial exchangeability. So the partial exchangeability is the, mat the mathematical dependent structure I will consider. And then I will move to define this uh, class of nested the processes based on completely random measures. And I will show you the degeneracy issue of the nested Dirichlet process and of all nested processes based on completely random measures uh, through, uh, theory, uh, through some uh, theorems. In the second part of the, um, of the talk, I will concentrate on this new class of Latin nested process, and I will show you how to overcome the, the, the degeneracy issue of the nested Dirichlet process. Federico, uh, Alessandra mentions that uh, uh, she cannot see the uh, new slides, but she can still see the title. So um, just to make sure, uh, try to see, uh, maybe share and share again and see if you can. Uh, um, okay. Try to move uh, the slide if you can now and from this to another one. Okay. Okay, now it looks like we are seeing uh, uh, the change slides. Do you, do you see? Yes, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is the outline of the presentation. So, um, uh, so as I mentioned, in the first part of the talk, I will concentrate on this class of nested processes based on completely random measures. And then I will move to define this new class of latent nested non-parametric priors. So uh, I will begin with the introduction of the mathematical dependent structure. So in statistics, a typical problem is, for example, the prediction of future outcomes of a certain experiment provided with uh, analogous observations. And the simplest form of analogy across data is exchangeability. So exchangeability means that the order in which the observations are recorded is irrelevant to carry out posterior of inference. And uh, uh, exchangeability is the simplest form of analogy which justifies induction. So, however, in a large variety of applied problems, exchangeability could be too restrictive. Since data, for example, are affected by some sort of heterogeneity, for example, in presence of time-dependent data, uh, when data comes from different do related experiments or uh, when you deal with the covariate index observations. So these are just uh, uh, some examples. Um, and uh, uh, Definetti uh, wrote that exchangeability can only be considered as a limiting case. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, is there some problem with the slide? Um, did, did you move to the other slide? It's still on the outline to me. 
It's still on the outrun, yes. So there is some issues. Try to, uh, so maybe one way, uh, uh, maybe either to share the desktop instead of just the presentation, that may help sometimes. Okay. Now we can see the second, the other slide, the new slide. The sculptor. Okay. Try sharing the desktop. Okay, and then expand Acrobat. Okay, perfect. Let's see if this works. Try to uh, switch slides. Sorry. So, does it work? It seems to work. Slide on exchangeability. Thank you. Oh, seems to work. Sorry about that again. Okay, is everything okay? It looks like it's okay. Try to switch, maybe again. Okay. 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 I've been in the show, so with Acrobat. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, so I introduced the notion of exchangeability and uh, uh, mm, as mentioned by Definetti, uh, exchangeability can only be considered as a limiting case uh, and uh, in a large variety of applied problems, so you have to, to, um, you have to, uh, to, to apply, to, to, um, to resort to more general dependent structures which are still tractable. And uh, he, you know, with these words, uh, definitely wanted to introduce the notion of partial exchangeability. Partial exchangeability is a um, more suitable assumption in many applied problems uh, when you have to deal with heterogeneous groups of observations. So in such a case, uh, in, in the paper and in this talk, I will focus on the case of two groups of observations. So you have two groups. Uh, and uh, um, partial exchangeability means that the observations uh, are uh, exchangeable within the same group, but they are conditionally independent across the diverse groups. So uh, there exists a very famous representation theorem, which is still due to definite, and which characterizes the law of a partial exchangeable sequence of observations. So two sequences of observations are partially exchangeable if and only if there exists a vector of dependent random probability measures, TDP1, TDP2, conditionally on which the couple of observations. So the first one in the first group and the second one belonging to the second group are IID as the product TDP1 times TDP2. And uh, <clears throat> the distribution of this vector of dependent random probability measure is, is called the definite measure of the sequence. So, um, uh, so the most recent Bayesian non-parametric literature has focused on the definition of different types of dependence for these two random probability measures. And in particular, there are several proposals in, uh, um, in the most recent Bayesian non-parametric literature to accommodate for heterogeneous groups of observations. So uh, I think that uh, you can recognize at least uh, three, uh, three the three structures in order to, uh, to define vectors of dependent random probability measures. So <clears throat> the first strategy uh, that has been proposed uh, is the additive structure. Uh, the, the main idea here is that uh, you have uh, each random probability measure is defined as a complex combination of two main components a common component across the all, all the groups and an idiosyncratic component which refers to each group of observations. So the idiosyncratic component is different for the different groups. So this is a, a first way to, uh, uh, to define vectors of dependent random probability measures. <clears throat> a second possibility relies on hierarchical strategies. So in such a case, uh, you have that uh, your different random probability measures depend on, uh, uh, on a common latent element, which is typically infinite dimensional. 
uh, for example, uh, the hierarchical gameplay process is a, a, a hierarchical strategy to define vectors of dependent random probability measures. And finally, uh, you can have also nested structures. So nest, mm, here, the main idea is that the different random probability measures are exchangeable random variables. So, uh, in the literature, then, so these are, I think that these are three main strategies, uh, and then uh, you can also have many other contributions in this direction. Um, so um, when you deal with uh, partially exchangeable sequences of observations, there are um, two typical problems arise. So the first one is that uh, um, partial exchangeability is a complex de dependent structure, and so you want to, you would like to, to, to derive the theoretical properties of your model and the closed form expressions for your quantities of interest. But this is typically difficult. So we are able to address the first issue in the paper in a nice way. And the <clears throat> second problem is that partial exchangeable sequences of observations are complex model. And it's also, it's also difficult to devise efficient and fast algorithms for your model. So in the paper, we devised a marginal algorithm in the case of two groups of observations, but uh, there are still open problems in this direction, and in particular, when you deal with many groups of observations. So, uh, so can you see the slide now? Yes. Yeah, OK. So um, now I want to introduce this, uh, first of all, these nested processes. I recall the definition of the nested Dirichlet process introduced by Rodriguez, Danson, and Gelfand. So the first line uh, tells you that we are in a partially exchangeable framework. The second line here tells you that uh, we are considering uh, nested structures, since uh, the different random probability measures are exchangeable random variables. As you can see here, the mixing measure, T the Q, is defined as the sum of random uh, probabilities at random locations. <clears throat> and in such a case, the locations are uh, the different, are different random probability measures. So these location G conani are random probability measures. And in particular, in the case of the nested Dirichlet process, they are, uh, they are Dirichlet processes. So, <clears throat> I will show you that if you have two samples, so the first one from the first group of observations and the second one from the second group of observations, and if the two samples share at least one value, then you have that uh, the two random probability measures here, TDP1 and TDP2, are equal to So this, the, the, this is the degeneracy property I mentioned uh, at the beginning. <clears throat> and in particular, this degeneracy property holds true for all nested processes based on completely random measures. Um, in, the, in the second, so in the first part of the talk, I will prove this degeneracy issue. And in the second part, I will move to define a model in order to overcome this drawback. Um, in order to introduce nested processes, um, in order to introduce nested processes, OK. Um, <clears throat> OK, so sorry. Um, so in order to introduce nested processes I, uh, based on completely random measures, I will introduce the notion of a completely random measures. Uh, um, 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 a random measure is simply a measure that is random, and uh, it's usually characterized, the law of this random measure is usually characterized by uh, its Laplace functional. <coughs> and the Laplace functional is defined in this way. So, <coughs> so uh, now if you, <coughs> if you consider a random measure, this is called a completely random if and only if the random variables till the, <coughs> till the mu a1, till the mu a k are independent random variables for any, for any choice of these joint or sets a1, a k, and for any k bigger than one. <coughs> in, the, uh, in the rest of the talk, I will concentrate myself, and also in the paper, I will concentrate myself on completely random measures like this. So they are some of random jumps at random locations. So, 
Um, and uh, um, so these uh, completely random measures are functionals of Poisson marked Poisson processes. And the Laplace functional can be written in the following exponential form. As you can see, the Laplace functional of these completely random measures depends only on this measure, which is called the Levy intensity of the completely random measure tilde mu. And it uniquely characterizes this type of completely random measure. A more general characterization of a completely random measure has been provided by Kinema. Now you can consider a completely random measure on the space of observations, and you can normalize it by the total mass, and you obtain a very large class of, uh, of random probability measures, which have been introduced by Regazzini, Lioi, and Proust, and they are called the normalized random measures with independent increments. So, um, so if you not, so this, uh, this class of random probability measures is, is a very broad class and it contains uh, many relevant examples. So the first one is uh, the Dirichlet process. And uh, um, how can you obtain that? So if you consider a gamma completely random measure, which is characterized by the following Levy intensity, as you can see here, then the associated normalized random measure is a Dirichlet process. If you now consider a sigma stable completely random measure, which is characterized by the following Levy intensity, then the associated normalized completely random measures is a sigma stable process. <clears throat> so in the sequel, I will focus on homogeneous normalized random measures. Uh, this, uh, this, class of, uh, uh, this class of normalized random measures uh, are characterized by a Levy intensity of the following type. Uh, in such a case, uh, the, the jumps and the locations in the previous uh, representations mm -hmm. are independent random variables. So, so I will denote, to denote the distribution of a normalized random measure uh, of the following type, uh, I will use the following notation. Uh, so as you can see this, uh, in this notation, so uh, it, mm, you can see rho C, which, are the, mm, which appears in the Levy intensity of the completely random measure and P0. P0 is called the base measure of the completely random measure. So uh, now we have all the ingredients to define uh, nested processes based on completely random measures. So these processes uh, generalize the traditional nested Dirichlet process. So the first line tells again that we are in a partial exchangeable framework, and the second line here tells you that uh, we are uh, considering nested structures. Um, as you um, as you can see, um, as you can see here, tilde Q is uh, the so tilde Q um, in the previous case was defined as sum of random jumps at random locations, and the locations were the Dirichlet processes. In this case. Uh, the, Completely random measure, so the, the mixing measure, the, the, the completely random measure, the, the random probability measure till the Q is defined as a normalized completely random measure till the mu on the space of all probability measures on X. So it can be represented as a sum of random jumps at random locations. And the locations in this case are not the replay process, but uh, the locations are normalized random measures. So, um, so tilde Q is a normalized random measures and the locations are again normalized random measures. Um, I want to point out that this model extends the traditional nested Dirichlet process by Rodriguez, Nelson, and Gelfand to the case of nested normalized random measures. Indeed, if you consider gamma completely random measures, so if tilde mu is a gamma completely random measure, and if these locations are again Dirichlet processes, then you recover the standard nested Dirichlet process. So, um, and a second property what I would like to point out, which is a nice property of uh, the nested Dirichlet process, is the following one. So, uh, since here T the Q is uh, almost surely discrete, then the probability that the two random probability measures are equal is bigger than zero. So, this property may be used to test equality uh, between the distributions of the different groups. 
So now I will uh, focus on the partition structure and the theoretical properties of the model. So now consider two samples, so the first one from the first group and the second one from the second group of size n1 and n2. And we consider here a nested process, a general nested process as defined before. So first of all, as you can see here, we have characterized the mixed moments of the, uh, the, the measure tilde Q, and in particular, the mixed moments of this measure tilde Q are a convex combination of two main terms. So, uh, as, so this term in red refers to a situation of full exchangeability across the different samples, and this term in green refers to a situation of independence across the samples. So this uh, is a very nice uh, characterization. This is a very nice property of the nest of these uh, nested processes. Um, and another nice property is the following one. So uh, you can have ties within the same samples or across different samples. Indeed, if you consider an observation from the first group and an, an observation from the second group, the probability that these two observations are equal is bigger than zero. And this is very useful. This is a very useful property, in order, uh, <coughs> to, which is related to the borrowing of strains across groups. So these are all nice properties. Now I want to show you the expression of the partition structure. So since uh, you, so since uh, um, there can be ties within the same sample and across different samples, the your the observations so. All the observations may be partitioned into k groups of distinct clusters according to the following schemes. So the first sample will contain k1 distinct values, which are specific to this sample and not shared with the second one. The second sample will contain k2 distinct values, which are specific to this sample and not shared with the first one. <laughs> and finally, the two samples will share k0 distinct values. Uh, these, these values are shared across the samples. Uh, so here we have the corresponding vectors of cluster fre frequencies. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in order to, uh, so uh, the probability of having a specific partition of the observations into k clusters of distinct values is called a partial exchangeable partition probability function. So the, the probability of having a specific partitions of the observations is the partial exchangeable partition probability function. This, uh, this uh, um, probabilistic um, <clears throat> function is very useful for, uh, for many inferential reasons. And in particular, it may be used to, uh, for many inferential goals. Uh, we have characterized the expression of the partial exchangeable partition probability function for uh, the nested for nested processes based on completely random measures. And we have proved that uh, this partial exchangeable partition probability function is a convex combination of two main terms. So a part in red, which refers to a situation of full exchangeability across samples, and a part in green, which refers to a situation of unconditional independence across samples. So this expression seems to be very nice. And the problem is that here you have, as you can see, you have an indicator function. So the indicator function that k0 is equal to 0. So if you have that k0 is bigger than 0, and it is usually the case, so if you have at least one value shared across the different samples, then this part in green disappears, and the model reduces to a, to a situation of full exchangeability across samples. So this is too restrictive, and uh, you have to, to fix uh, this issue. Um, why this is too restrictive? <clears throat> because the model reduces to, the, to a situation of full exchangeability, and you want to, uh, to, to model with, with the nested, uh, nested Dirichlet process, you want to model a situation of heterogeneous groups of observations. So, uh, in order to show you the effect of this uh, property, of this degeneracy property, I will uh, suggest an example uh, related to density estimation. <clears throat> so here we consider uh, the problem of estimating two random dependent densities coming from uh, two different sequences relate, um, referring to two different uh, groups of observations. So, so we, we use a traditional mixture model here 
where H, as you can see, is a Gaussian kernel. <coughs> we have estimated the two, the two random dependent densities, which refer to the two groups of observations using an MCMC procedure, which is based on the, uh, on the expression of the partial exchangeable partition probability function. <coughs> so um, uh, we, we consider an example here. So as you can see, we have the two samples of size 100. And these two samples have been generated by two mixtures of normal distribution. So as you can see, the two mixtures uh, share one uh, component, which is the normal with mean five. So as you can see here, we have estimated the two densities for the, first, for the two groups of observations. So uh, here we have the estimated densities for the first group, and here we have the estimated densities for the second group. Uh, we are comparing the estimated densities with the true densities. As you can see, the estimated densities are in blue, while the true densities are in red. And the, as you can see, the, two, the, the estimated densities are the same for the, for the two group, for both the groups of observations. So uh, why, uh, why this behavior? Uh, so the presence of the common component across the group, which is the normal with mean five, forces the equality, forces the equality across the two random probability measures. So the two random probability measures are equal because, uh, because the model is able to recognize that there is a common component across the different groups. And, uh, um, and this, uh, this fact forces, forces the equality. So you have that the two random probability measures are equal. And uh, as a consequence, the two estimated densities are the same across the different groups. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, a result, this is a consequence of the degeneracy issue of the nested Dirichlet process and of nested processes based on completely random measures. So the question is, uh, how can we address this issue? How can we preserve heterogeneity across the different samples? Uh, and uh, how can we preserve from one side, we want to preserve a heterogeneity across the different samples, and from the other side, we would like to, uh, to maintain all the nice properties of the nested Dirichlet process. Uh, so um, a possible suggestion that we proposed in our paper is to resort to these latent nested models. And in particular, uh, how, um, so uh, as you can see, we have defined these uh, the, the different random probability measures in a different way. And they are defined as uh, the, sum, the normalized sum of the two completely random measures. So uh, first of all, uh, you have that mi1 and mi2, uh, the, the, the two completely random measures appearing here, mi1 and mi2 are nested completely random measures. So the nesting structure here, here is at the level of the completely random measures. And then uh, we have added a common component across the different groups. So this common completely random measure has the, um, the ability to preserve um, heterogeneity across the different groups. Okay. So um, the, I want also to underline that the the intensity of this completely random measure is the following one, and it depends on this parameter gamma. So, um, I, first of all, I point out that uh, these are some remarks. I point out that each random probability measure may be written as a convex combination of two main components, a component, a component pi, which is again uh, which has a nested structure where the nesting structure is created at the level of the completely random measures. Mm -hmm. And then here we have also this common component, PS, which has the role to preserve heterogeneity across the different samples. So another property, <coughs> another property which is preserved is the following one. So the probability that the two random probability measures across the different groups are equal is again bigger than zero. So the, the nested structure, the, this property, which is a, a natural property in nested models, is preserved. And finally, the parameter gamma, which appears here, so the parameter gamma, which appears in the Levy intensity of the shared component, uh, has the, the role to 
to, to tune the effect of the shared completely random measures. And in particular, I would like to underline that as gamma goes to zero, we recover the standard nested model. So uh, again, we study the partition structure of the model. And uh, uh, in particular, we consider again the two samples coming from the two groups of observations. And uh, now I am dealing with uh, this latent nested process. Uh, so uh, we have characterized the mixed moment of the, 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 uh, of the random probability measure to the Q, which uh, is uh, defined here. Okay. So uh, the mixed moments of the, uh, the random probability measure till the Q are again, are again a convex combination of a situation of full exchangeability in red and a situation of uh, independence across samples in green. So we have again a nice property as before. But in such a case, here we are working on the space of all measures on X instead uh, or, um, instead working on the space of all probability measures on X. And what about the degeneracy property of the nested Birkley process? Is it still true in this case? The answer is no. So, <clears throat> and in particular, we have determined the expression of the partial exchangeable partition probability function for these uh, nested, uh, for these uh, latent nested processes. And the expression of the, um, the partial exchangeable partition probability function is the following one. As you can see, again, we have a convex combination of a situation of full exchangeability in red and a situation of, uh, in the, uh, of a situation, general situation of dependent data in green. So uh, as you can see here, we don't have, again, the indicator function as uh, in the previous uh, representation. But uh, uh, here we are able to maintain the heterogeneity across the different groups of observations. So, so this, uh, uh, so the, the previous expression of the partial exchangeable partition probability function seems to be um, seems to be very complicated, but uh, it's it's very easy. In, so it simplifies in many examples of interest, and in particular, in the case of latent nested sigma stable processes. For example, if you consider latent nested sigma stable processes, then the expression of the partial exchangeable partition probability function is the following one. As you can see. Very easy to evaluate, and in particular, it depends solely on this integral on zero one, which can be evaluated, for example, resorting to a numerical uh, procedure. So uh, now we um, we consider again the example uh, of density estimation to show that the model does not, does not exhibit the degeneracy issue that uh, was. Uh, as in the nested the Riclet process case. And uh, um, to do this, uh, we have uh, considered two, two samples here, x1 and x2, of size 100, coming from uh, uh, two different mixtures of normal distribution. Again, the two mixtures share a common component, which is the part in green, and it's a normal distribution with mean 5. <clears throat> and in such a case, so in this example, we have, we have run an NCMC procedure, which is based on the expression of the partial exchangeable partition probability function. And uh, uh, we have estimated the two, uh, the two densities in the two different, for the two different groups. So as you can see, the estimated densities uh, are in blue, while the two densities are in red. And uh, uh, the, uh, the estimates are accurate. Um, and I would also like to underline that, um, uh, as you can see here, the, the common component, which is the normal with mean five, is better estimated in both the cases. This is, I think that this is mainly due to the boring of strands across the different groups of observations. So uh, as for the clustering structure, the model is able to recognize that the, um, uh, the, the, the two uh, so the two groups of observations come from two mixtures having two different components. So uh, here, the, the first mixture have two components, which is the first one is the normal with mean five, then the second one is the normal with mean 10. So uh, the model is able to 
to, to only recognize that the mixture has two main components. Okay, so in such a case, you have no problems in density estimation. So uh, I want to conclude with another possible application of the model, and in particular, um, I want to deal with the problem of hypothesis testing. So um, again, we consider the two, the two samples, uh, and we consider the latent nested process as before. So um, I want to underline that a nice property of the nested uh, of, of all nested structures is the following one. So the probability that the two random probability measures are equal is bigger than zero. And in our case, this probability amounts to be the probability that the two nesting, the two nested completely random measures coincide. <clears throat> we have also proved that the indicator function of this event, so of the event that the two random probability measures are equal, amounts to be the indicator function of this event. So uh, this, um, the, such an indicator function may be used to employ to, 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 test equality, to test equality between the distribution of the two samples, uh, referring to the two different samples. And in particular, we would like to test um, the, uh, we would like to test this hypothesis. So we would like to test if the two distributions referring to the two different groups are equal against all the possible alternatives. In order to do this, we evaluate the base factor according uh, to the output of the NCMC procedure. So on the basis of the output of the NCMC procedure, you can easily evaluate this base factor, uh, with, which, as, as you can see, depends on the, on the random variable i. <clears throat> so we have uh, some examples. Uh, and in particular, we have three different examples. We have generated the two samples, again of size 100, in different uh, scenarios. So the first scenario we consider is the scenario in which uh, the, two, um, the, two, the two samples come from the same distribution, which is this one, okay? And uh, um, as you can see, we have run the MCMC procedure and we have obtained the following base factor. The base factor is bigger than one and we are inclined to accept the null. So we are inclined to reject uh, the uh, difference between the two distributions. Um, the second example here is an example in which we have considered two different uh, uh, distributions for the two samples, but the two different distributions here share uh, a norm, share a common component, which is the normal with mean five. So we have run again the CMC procedure, and as you can see, the base factor is less than one. And again, we are inclined, so and, uh, the model is able to recognize the difference between the two distributions. In the last example, we have considered a different example, more complicated example in which the two, um, so the two, um, the two groups come from uh, two different mixtures, but sharing the same components here, so the normal will mean five and the normal will with mean, uh, with mean zero, but with different weights. So, <clears throat> The only, the only difference across the, the different dis, uh, across the, the distributions is in the weights. The mod, so the, as you can see, the base factor has increased, but is still less than one, and we are inclined, we are inclined to accept H1. <clears throat> so uh, the model seems to work, so the results seem to, seem to be promising and seem to work, to work very well in this example. And I want to conclude this first part of uh, the talk with a summary, uh, with a small discussion on uh, this, uh, this first part. So um, I proved, uh, so in, in the paper, we proved uh, the degeneracy issue of the nested directory process. And uh, we have shown that, that this degeneracy property holds true not only for the nested directory process, but for all nested processes based on completely random measures. So in order to overcome uh, the drawback, uh, we have introduced this uh, class of latent nested non-parametric priors, uh, which, uh, uh, and we have uh, successfully addressed the issue of the degeneracy problem.
property. Uh, all the results are available in closed form, are, I think that they are elegant result, and uh, uh, everything is in closed form. But uh, there are some open problems that uh, have to be addressed. And uh, these open problems, I think that they have been also raised by many discussants. So the first one is related to what's happened. So in, in the paper, we have considered the case of two groups of observations. But what's happened if you consider more than two groups? So uh, if uh, these bigger than two, there are both computational and theor theoretical issues that have to be addressed in such a case. Uh, then uh, another, uh, another <clears throat> issue, another, another open problem is the flexibility of the model. So how to improve the flexibility of the model in order to accommodate for different uh, uh, applications, and in particular, how to allow to have different relative weights which are related to the shared components. And uh, the last one is really, so in the paper we have, uh, uh, so we have proposed uh, this uh, measure so this, uh, this vector of uh, dependent and non-parametric priors, uh, but how to measure the dependence across the different uh, random probability measures. Uh, so how to measure the dependence induced by uh, this model. So with this, uh, I, <clears throat> I conclude uh, this, uh, the, the first part of my talk. Uh, and then I would like also to discuss uh, these points uh, in, uh, in the rejoinder. Thank you, Federico, uh, uh, for the nice presentation. So the paper was uh, uh, selected as a discussion paper for Bayesian analysis due to the uh, importance of the issue of the generalism that was shown and the possible solution uh, that you presented uh, uh, in your talk. And uh, so we invited uh, a few uh, discussants, in particular, uh, Vera Liu and Peter Mueller, um, Fernando Quintana and Alejandro Hara, Alessandra Guglielmi and Berardo, uh, uh, sorry, Maria, uh, Mario Braha, sorry, <laughs> uh, have uh, uh, agreed to contribute in various discussions. We also had uh, contributed discussions by Christian Robert, uh, Lima, Emanuele Aliverti, Sally Paganin, Tommaso Rigon, and Massimiliano Russo, and also from Fabrizio Leisen and Alan, Alan Riva Palacio. Um, here in uh, uh, our uh, Webinar today, we have Alessandra Guglielmi and Mario Behraha uh, and uh, um, Vera Liu and Peter Muller. I would uh, uh, suggest uh, that we start with Alessandra and Mario and uh, um, they will tell us uh, their uh, contribution. Very nice. Alessandra? Okay. Yes, sorry, we are share. trying to share our screen. Okay, I'm gonna stop then Federico and I'll let you uh, go ahead and share your screen. No, I mean, it didn't work. Let's see. Share. Try. Okay, maybe now. Okay, try again. Okay, this one. Yes. Control L. Yes. No, Control L. Okay. okay, so Mario is going to talk. So, uh, first of all, is it working? I'm changing slide now, so. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so first of all, let us thank uh, Federico and his co-authors for this uh, beautiful paper and very nice presentation. And also thanks to Bayesian Analysis and Michele Windani for hosting this webinar. That is a very interesting new format. Uh, so uh, let us just review very briefly what we think are the main contributions from Federico's paper. So what we, we thought is that one of the main contributions is that they formally address the degeneracy issue that arises when nesting discrete random measures. And uh, in order to uh, overcome this degeneracy, a new, uh, random prob uh, a new model for a vector of random probability measures is proposed and termed latent nested process that it is then used to model the density of data arising from different groups. And what we think is really interesting is that the tests for homogeneity of distributions is available very straightforwardly from their, uh, from their model and from the MCMC outputs they have. 
uh, I think that there are uh, two key ideas in this paper. And the first one is uh, nesting discrete random probability measures. And this allows to detect the homogeneity of distribution. And the second one is the contamination of the population distributions with a common component. And this is what avoids the degeneracy problem. However, the main drawback that we can identify from the manuscript and also this presentation is that there is a huge uh, computational burden involved with the MCMC simulation required from the to, to have posterior anal analysis. So what we wanted to do is within this framework to extend their model to a uh, big eye population with I greater than two and moderate moderate size still but greater than two so in the in the comments of the paper there are two solutions that are proposed by the authors and the first one is to derive the posterior characterization of this process and the second one is instead to resort to a stick breaking representation to gain computational efficiency and here is the starting point of our contribution to this discussion so we decided to build on the uh, second proposed solution and we chose a particular bmp prior a very popular uh, bmp prior so that we let the uh, pro run the vector of random probability measures one for each of the population so p tilde one p tilde i to be distributed as a latent nested directly process that we will formalize in the next slide and moreover, we also truncate the stick breaking representation of all the random probability measures involved. And this uh, yields a model that is straightforward to compute, at least let's say it's straightforward to implement in uh, standard softwares like JAGS, which is exactly what we did. So we consider this class of latent nested Dirichlet process mixture models. So we have data from uh, big I population and for each population we assume that conditioning on a random probability measure the samples are iid from a kernel mixture with a kernel f and the vector p tilde one p tilde i is distributed as a latent nested Dirichlet process that is each p tilde i is a contamination of a shared component ps weighted by one minus wi with uh, another component that is uh, idiosyncratic for that group. So the PIs are in turn a draw from a nested Dirichlet process, as in the notation from uh, uh, Rodriguez and co authors, and PS is itself a Dirichlet process. And the weights are, uh, are expressed as follows, and this means where the mu i's are just the unnormalized version of the gamma process involved, so associated to the Dirichlet process. And just observe that marginally these WIs are distributed as betas, but not jointly, of course, because of the shared component that is shared between all the WIs. So in this slide, uh, we just uh, review very briefly the uh, truncation of the stick breaking. So this is the same a priori truncation that was proposed by Ishvaran and James, and that is also employed by uh, Rodriguez and co-authors in the implementation uh, of the uh, conditional algorithm for the nested Dirichlet process. And so we, we can skip it. Uh, in this discussion, we, con we uh, conducted a simulation study uh, for data arising from uh, a variety of group. In particular, we consider two examples with two groups. Uh, so reproducing two of the examples showed by Federico in his presentation. And we also consider an example with three groups and another one with four groups. So this is exactly, uh, I think, example one from Federico's presentation. So we have that the two data, the two groups are homogeneous and data arising from uh, group one and group two are iid from a mixture of two normals and here in the in the picture we report in red the uh, true density that generated the data 
And in black, the estimates that we get through uh, the, our MCMC simulation that was implemented in JAWS. So what we can see is that uh, the location and the scales of the mixture components are recovered fairly enough, let's just say. Uh, but the weights associated to them are kind of terrible. And the, the base factor for the homogeneity, homogeneity test is uh, non-informative as well as it uh, equals to 1.0. On the other hand, when, uh, when full exchangeability does not hold, our model seems to perform a little better. So this is example two from Federico's presentation. Uh, and uh, again, we have data from uh, a two component mixture of normal uh, for, with a shared component with mean five and different weight associated to this component across group one and group two. And what we can see is that uh, the density estimates are uh, better than the previous case. Uh, for both group one and group two. And also the base factor for homogeneity is more consistent with the true data generation generating mechanism. Uh, here we show instead an example with three groups. And again, we have uh, the first two groups are uh, fully exchangeable. So they are homogeneous while the third one is instead different from both of them. And in this case, well, the base factor uh, for comparing one and three that are different and for comparing two and three are pretty consistent with the true data generation generation. While instead the base factor for comparing one and two that should be homogeneous are not so convincing. And this is kind of a light motive that we saw through our implementation that these base factors are more, much more uh, convinced, let's say, when they are comparing different population, but they are not so good at recovering the homogeneity case. So we also mentioned an example with four population that we do not report here, but let us just report the computational burden involved with this posterior simulation. So we have that going from two population uh, to four population, the the computational burden increases almost quadratically with the number of population. And we believe this is mainly due to the huge number of latent variables that are uh, that is required by the JAGS implementation. And moreover, these latent variables are uh, all discrete. And this is uh, kind of a problem for the mixing speed as it's well known. So some uh, concluding remarks. So what we did was to truncate the stick breaking representation and this makes the implementation of uh, even such complicated models fairly fairly simple in uh, in languages like JAGS or bugs. However, the proposed approximation combined with possible mixing issues that arise from JAGS uh, did not fully re uh, replicate the results of the margin marginal algorithm that was proposed by Federico. Let us just point out that the uh, prior that we used is also different because we used a Dirichlet process prior while mm -hmm. I was using a, a Sigma stable prior, which is different. We believe that exploiting the, con the conjugacy, for example, of the kernel and the base measure uh, may help reduce the number of variables of latent variables involved and also improve the mixing speed in JAGS, but we didn't test it out. So in conclusion, uh, we do agree with the authors that if one wanted to extend this, this framework to a case with a even moderate uh, size of groups, uh, there is the need to derive the posterior characterization of this latent nested Dirichlet process or any other latent nested process, or to uh, tailor MCMC based MCMC schemes that are significantly more efficient and tailored to the problems. So, okay, once again, thank, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, we can uh, continue having uh, um, Vera, Liu, and Peter Mueller um, deliver their discussion. Stop share. Okay.
Uh, I think they need to stop first. They are still sharing. Idea. I think you could probably. Uh, hello. Uh, now. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Do share and okay, it's this. Oh well, I can just share my screen and go. Share probably desktop, I think. But... Yes. Um. Um. Can you all see my screen that has the title page of the discussion? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, so I guess I can get started. Um, so um, first, we would like to thank the authors for addressing the partial exchangeability problems and um, for offering a more generalized version of the nested derivative process, which um, has the degeneracy problem. Um, so we would like to start our discussion by, um, well, I can, um, can, you, can you see my slides going to the next slide? Yes. Cool. Um, so uh, we would like to start off the discussion by um, putting a few, putting together a few um, um, non-parametric priors together um, and offer an overview. So on the left column, we have the hierarchical judicial process. And in this setup, we will notice that, um, so like across all the three columns we have um, on the bottom row, um, to be the related distribution that we are interested in. Um, so for the hierarchical judicial process, we will notice that um, the resulting G1, G2, and G3, they would all share the same clusters, but with all different weights. Um, and also in the center column, um, there were two alternatives. One is the nested derivative process, and the other one is the more generalized version of nested process that are proposed by the authors. Um, so we will notice that um, in either case, um, both of the two options would, on, uh, would offer um, the resulting distribution that we are interested in to um, share either non-common atoms at all or the whole distribution. Um, in this case, um, G1 and G3 have the same distribution and G2 um, has no common atoms at all with those two. So, and this was the degeneracy problem that's mentioned by the author. And we um, would like to um, put the latent nested process in this network as well. Um, so on the, on the bottom column, uh, on the bottom row, G1 and G2 are the resulting distributions that is a result of um, two additive components um, one of them, uh, mu s stands for the common shared cluster and mu j for each um, distinct group would stand for um, the group distinctive parameters um, or group distinct centers. So we believe that the setup of this um, additive decomposition would allow the two distributions, two resulting distributions to um, have a both shared common clusters and their group distinctive clusters. Um, so obviously um, the latent, latent nested process is, offers a nice generalization to the structure, but we also notice that um, it is, as for now, practically restricted to the case where we only have two groups. So um, we would maybe um, like, the, um, we will love the author's comments on like when maybe this is a good trade-off or like when would we like the when would we prefer the generalization over uh, the practicality of implementation. So um, then we will go to our next slide where um, it's another point in our discussion is uh, the Okay, um, so um, we also look at, if I go back to the previous slide, we will notice that um, since mu zero is, mu zero star is the common shared cluster and when it is shared across the two subpopulations, um, we would um, notice that the relative weights of each component in the shared cluster won't change and it's fixed up to proportionality 
So um, we offer a little summary on how flexible the weight assignments are and how um, how flexible we are. Uh, it is a lot, uh, how flexible the weight assignment is allowed for different setups. So in this little graph, uh, the horizontal axis represents um, heterogeneity of clusters, which obviously for um, nested judicial process, we would either have <clears throat> both um, all the groups share all the clusters the same or all the clusters are different. So those are the two only options. And as we mentioned before, the hierarchical process would allow clusters to be shared, but they can all bear different weights. And the author's idea for latent nested process would place um, this model set up in the middle here because um, obviously we are allowing our, a flexible, um, uh, a certain amount of flexibility in um, the heterogeneity of clusters because we can um, have either shared or non-shared clusters, um, but um, they won't have a varying weights if the, the, the vertical axis represents um, how much weight difference we are allowing beyond proportionality. So what it's saying here is the latent nested process, it would allow um, different subpopulations to share um, either the same or common or non-common clusters, but if they have the shared clusters, then the relative weights of those shared clusters um, does not vary beyond proportionality, which is the case that's um, uh, in the right column of the graph here. Um, everything that's shared from mu zero star uh, would have to keep their relative weight um, in the distribution that we are interested in. Um, so here we would um, love to um, maybe propo propose um, a different perspective that would allow a model to generalize into um, allowing varying weights among shared clusters beyond proportionality. So, um, wait. Um, so um, we proposed an alternative latent nested process um, we used the example from um, um, from the author's paper from section 5.1, except we made a little change. So um, we are um, in two separate studies. Um, here we are um, thinking about like a setup of maybe we have two studies um, from we have two um, different clinical studies that focus on different groups of patients. Um, so uh, we have two studies and they have a shared comments which are outlined by the box here, um, but they're shared in relative different ways and each of them have, each of them has a, a non-shared component which is centered at one and minus one relative, uh, respectively. So here the problem we wanna address is um, how can we model the different weight assignment, even if the clusters are shared. Um, so here we will pro um, propose to look, at, to look at the problem from a feature allocation perspective, where we view all those centers as essentially features for each study. So now we have a feature specific parameter, which are the center of the clusters. So here theta is, um, it incorporates all the possible um, cluster parameters, cluster centers as atoms. So we have a five and zero are shared and one and minus one are not shared. And then we have a feature membership matrix that specifies whether each study or whether each subpopulation um, has the representation of that feature. So in this case, we have on the top row, um, first subpopulation has the first three atoms as the uh, first three clusters, and um, the second population has um, a different uh, a different distinct distinctive one, but two shared ones. Um, and also, we would um, propose um, a weight class uh, a weight assignment matrix, which 
as both feature specific and study or subpopulation specific. So here it just um, summarized the information that are um, expressed from the two different studies. And, and here we would like to notice that first, it offers a flexible weight assignment because um, the rows of the double matrix are independent of each other. And it is both feature specific and study specific. That means for each study, we would be able to propose um, a row of W that specifies the weight assignment within that study. And also we would like to notice the, the generalization of this model setup into um, D larger than two essentially, um, because here um, we can just extend Z into three rows if we have three studies and four rows if, uh, if we have four studies. Um, and that won't change much about the MCMC implementation because we are essentially um, not restricting well, the, the setup doesn't restrict Z to two and um, W would have the same dimension as Z as we have more studies. Um, but so that is a certain amount of flexibility, but we also um, would like to notice that um, as the authors mentioned in their original paper, um, everything is elegant and in closed form. And we are aware that by doing this whole new setup, we are losing some of the mathematical trackability. Um, so maybe we would love to hear some comments on that as well. So um, that's, our, that's our discussion. And um, thanks for everyone's time and attention. Thank you very much, Vera. Um, I will leave uh, now the word again to uh, Federico. Uh, so that he can provide uh, his rejoinder, and then we will open uh, for discussion from the uh, attendees. Air Ms. Queen? Yes. Okay. So can you see it? Yes. Okay, so thanks for, for the nice points raised uh, in uh, the discussions. And I would like to, to add uh, the rejoinder. And uh, in the rejoinder, I will try to, to answer uh, these questions and also to address uh, other issues raised uh, in, uh, in the other discussions. So there are many uh, interesting points that have to be addressed uh, as uh, uh, as I, um, as I said at the end of the previous presentations, and I think that uh, uh, the issues raised by um, the different discussants can be uh, classified in three main points. So the computational issue, so what's happening if you have more than two populations? <clears throat> How can you address uh, the case of more than two groups of observations? How to improve the flexibility? of the model and this uh, it's uh, uh, related to the, to the second slide of, uh, of Vera and in particular uh, how to allow to have different relative weights on the shared components and uh, finally another uh, question uh, is related to the dependent structure induced by the model so I would like to begin with the first uh, question so how can we address the case of uh, more than two samples so this, uh, um, so this, uh, this case has been uh, deeply investigated in the discussion by Alessandra and Mario, and uh, uh, also Vera mentioned that, that uh, there are some problems uh, so with the case of uh, more than two groups of observations. So, um, why there are problems. So there are theoretical hurdles, uh, combinatorial hurdles, the, the mathematics, <clears throat> so there are problems with the mathematical tractability uh, of, uh, uh, the, of the model when you have to deal with more than two groups of observations. So, and uh, another problem is that uh, we have devised uh, the uh, marginal algorithm in the case, uh, so the, the marginal algorithm is efficient in the case of two groups, but uh, 
for more than two groups, uh, the computational burden is very high, as also underlined by uh, Mario in the previous discussion. So uh, these are our remarks and suggestions. So first of all, uh, I want to, to say that the theory may be developed uh, in general. So also when you deal with uh, more than two groups of observation, you can uh, obtain close formal results. The problem is that uh, there are many combinatorial hurdles uh, and uh, uh, the, the formulas that you obtain, so all the, um, all the expressions that you obtain are very complex. So it's difficult to use them in practice. And uh, for this reason, you have to resort, uh, you, you require to, to, to address, um, so you require to, uh, to, to use a computational based approach. And in particular, there are two main, I think that there are two main uh, methods in order to, uh, to devise efficient computational algorithms in the case of more than two groups. So first of all, the first, uh, the first strategy has been already investigated in the, uh, in the discussion by uh, Mario and Alessandra, and it's uh, to use the stick-breaking representation of the Dirichlet process. So, so you can use uh, these uh, stick-breaking representations and a truncation scheme in order to develop uh, more efficient computational methods. They, um, they pointed out that uh, there are some problems uh, using JAX, and I think that uh, probably, as also mentioned by Mario, an ad hoc MCMC procedure can speed up uh, the, the algorithm. Um, so uh, I, I want, to, uh, with regard to this point, I would also to say that uh, uh, the results obtained by Mario and Alessandra, so they, um, they uh, focused on the same examples uh, we, we had in the paper and the results uh, that they, they have obtained with with the Dirichlet process are worse than our results. I think that uh, this is mainly due for two reasons. So the first one is uh, the fact that uh, they are using a different algorithm, which is based on a truncation scheme. Uh, so it's not uh, a marginal algorithm. And the second reason, I think it's due to, uh, to the fact that, uh, to the limited flexibility of the Dirichlet process. Um, and uh, so um, a possibility uh, in order to overcome this issue is to use uh, the peak major process. I think it's not difficult to extend our result in the case of the peak major process. So this is uh, a first remark. Uh, and a uh, uh, second strategy uh, that can be used in order to devise uh, uh, more efficient uh, algorithms is to, uh, first of all, to characterize the posterior distribution of the random probability measures, and then to uh, devise conditional need. For example, uh, mm, for example, one can uh, resort to the conditional important sampling scheme, which has been developed by Antonio Canali, Riccardo Corradin, and, and Bernardo Nipoti, or to other conditional algorithms uh, in order to to, to develop efficient computational methods. So this is, uh, these are my remarks for the case of more than two groups of observations. And uh, then I would like to, to move to the second point, which uh, concerns the flexibility of the model. So how can we improve? There are some discussions there, uh, the, the, all the discussions are suggested many um, different strategies to, uh, to, to improve the flexibility of, uh, of the model we suggested. First of all, as outlined in the talk by, uh, by Vera, um, so our model does not allow to have different relative weights on the shared components. What does it mean? So if you look at, uh, so I, I recall here, uh, the definition of our latent nested random probability measures. So as you can see, it's a complex combination of two main components. So this one is, uh, has a nested structure, and this one is shared across the different groups. The problem is that, as you can see here, we use uh, the same component, so the same shared component for all the groups of observation. So 
if you have two groups of observations, this is not a, two, two groups, uh, this is not a problem. But if you have to deal with more than two groups, this could be a problem. And uh, it's better to accommodate for having different relative weights on the shared, uh, on the shared atoms. So there are many solutions, and some of these are suggested by the discussants. So the first, the first one is suggested by uh, Fabrizio Leisen and Alaviva Palacio, uh, who <clears throat> they suggested to replace this common component with a vector of compound random measures. And uh, this is very useful. So if you use vectors of compound random measures, then uh, you don't have the same, pro the same problem as here. Uh, another solution which uh, uh, works, I uh, think, <clears throat> and we are uh, working on this, is again to define uh, this uh, latent, so this, uh, uh, this nested structure, use again the nested structure, but till the Q prime here is defined as a sum of random jumps at random locations. And uh, uh, the locations are assumed, so the location GI are random probability measures, and they can be assumed to share the same clusters, but with different weights. As for example, in uh, the paper by Jacopo Soriano and Lima. Um, so I think that uh, this uh, is uh, a nice way to address um, uh, the issue of uh, the, to accommodate uh, for uh, different uh, relative weights on the shear pool. So, uh, and uh, finally, <clears throat> there are other two points that have been uh, raised by uh, discussants, Quintana, Fernando Quintana and Alejandro Yara, who suggested to, to improve the dependent structure of the model, including covariates, and in particular, covariates may be included in, uh, um, in the Levine, for example, in the Levy intensity of the complicity random measures, or otherwise uh, in uh, um, the uh, clusters at the cluster levels. So, uh, and finally, there are, <clears throat> there are two ways uh, to extend again the, these nested structures in two different directions. So the first one is suggested by Lima. So in, in the paper we used uh, in the talk, I focused on uh, normalized uh, random measures. Uh, uh, and in such a situation, the, uh, the parameters uh, of the model, which describe the model, flex uh, the, the, flex the dispersion, uh, the dispersion related to the random probability measures, are, um, are finite dimensional parameter. In order to, to have more flexibility on this dispersion parameter, um, another way to uh, possible way in order to, uh, to have more flexibility on the dispersion parameter is to, to, to define nested polyatree processes. And in such a case, uh, your dispersion parameter is infinite dimensional. Uh, this is suggested uh, in the discussion by Lima. And uh, uh, another, uh, <clears throat> another possible uh, way, so in, so in the paper we addressed uh, we, we defined these uh, nested structures, which can be um, seen uh, nested structure designed for this is something more so, uh, But uh, uh, it's possible to extend our uh, our la our uh, latent nested structures to the case of feature models, and in particular, as uh, pointed out by you, uh, by Vera and Peter. Uh, I think that it's not it's not difficult to extend so um, the model um, the model we proposed to the case of a feature to a situation of uh, feature models, uh, and in particular, it's, uh, it's it's easy I think to define um, to define a prior distribution for dependent populations of features. Uh, so. Um, for example, it's possible to define nested beta nested beta completely random measures in order to, uh, to, to face the case of multiple populations of features. So these are, these are all ways to improve the flexibility of the model. And uh, uh, finally, I would like to conclude uh, to conclude the talk, uh, giving some uh, um, remarks on the dependent structure induced 
by, uh, by our model. So uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, at the, the end of the previous talk, uh, we have defined this vector of uh, dependent random probability measures, but we didn't measure the dependence uh, induced uh, by the model. In order to measure the dependence across the different uh, random probability measures, you can evaluate, for example, the correlation uh, um, between tilde P1, uh, so um, between the two random probability measures on the same set A. So we have, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not difficult to see that this is the general expression of the correlation uh, across uh, the two random probability measures. And uh, uh, in, <clears throat> for example, in the case of latent tested Dirichlet uh, processes, this expression boils down to the following formula, uh, which involves an hypergeometric function. I want also to remark that uh, this uh, expression goes to one as the parameter gamma goes to infinity. The parameter gamma was the parameter arising in the Levine intensity of the shear component. Uh, another, uh, so if you consider, for example, Latin nested stable processes, again, you can easily evaluate the correlation structure across the two random probability measure, which is the following one. And again, as a limiting case, you obtain that uh, this correlation goes to one as gamma goes to infinity. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, so this expression, this general expression of the correlation gives you uh, an uh, intuition about the uh, dependence across the different random probability measures, but these results are also in tune with the, uh, the nice results um, by Emanuele Aliverti and co-authors in the discussion, and in particular they show that uh, as gamma goes to infinity, the different random probability measures are evolutionary. And this is clearly, uh, this clearly is in tune with our findings. So uh, I conclude uh, my rejoinder and uh, I am open to questions. And I would like also again to thank the editor and uh, Michele and uh, the, all the discussants of uh, the paper. Thank you, Enrico. So let's see if there are questions from the attendees of the panel. So there is a question. I so. If, if uh, you have questions, uh, also you can, maybe if you cannot, uh, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. If you are not, uh, uh, you may be able to uh, raise your hand in uh, the uh, participants. Okay, yes. Very good. So, okay, can I answer the, can I answer the question? Bye. Well, let's see if I... I'm having issues, sorry, to uh, unmute. Uh, um, you may want to unmute yourself. So okay. I've seen a, a um, question on the chat. Okay, perfect. Both in the paper and also in the discussion by the discussants, the variances of all components in the simulation studied are considered to be the same. How the proposed model is sensitive to the different variances of the different components. So, uh, um, so I think that there are no problems with uh, uh, different variances, but uh, to be honest, I didn't try, uh, I didn't remember uh, what happened if you, uh, if you change the variances uh, across uh, the different components, but uh, I don't think uh, there are issues with uh, different uh, variances. Perfect. Are we are there any further comments? Any further questions? You can okay, Lee, let's see if you can able you should probably un unmute yourself. Uh yes. Can you, hear me? Go ahead. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, forgot to change my picture. Anyway, um, so 
uh, great talk and uh, nice discussions. I uh, I have a question about um, Peter and Vera's uh, comment about using feature selection and uh, the, the how do you have any comments or thoughts, thoughts. authors uh, Federico and and or Peter and Vera on the prior specifications for the for the uh, the structures that you induce and uh, uh, how important are those? Uh, um, I think that it's possible to define uh, this, uh, um, this prior in the context of multiple populations of uh, features. And instead of normalizing uh, the, uh, the nested, the completely random measures, you take uh, the completely random measures itself. I think like, uh, for example, I think uh, mm, it's the same to define a beta process a nested beta process. So you don't need to normalize the, uh, the completely random measures, but uh, as a prior, you can use the completely random measures itself, provided that uh, the jumps are in between zero one. And instead of uh, evaluating, for example, the, um, um, the partial exchangeable partition probability function, you have uh, in, in the context of feature models to evaluate a uh, similar object, uh, generalized object, which is the, uh, the feature allocation probability function. I don't think, uh, so uh, I, I think that it's, it's not difficult to, uh, to develop. So you know, the, the model could be still tractable uh, also in the context of features because you don't have to normalize for uh, the, um, the for the two completely random measures. So is there uh, any other question about that? Or? Uh, it, it's I, good. I Peter, do you want to, Vera, yeah. do you want to comment further? Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, basically, yeah, I think the question is mostly answered already, but uh, we are actually, um, well, we can think about uh, the uh, membership matrix, which is the Z matrix we proposed um, that only has zero or one. Um, it can come from um, like an Indian buffet process that assigns whether like each population has that feature or, um, and for our weight, weight matrix and um, feature specific parameter, which has, is our theta vector, um, those are just from uh, like independent, um, like the the weight matrix would be um, like just uh, they can have like independent priors for um, each center, uh, each cluster center, and each um, study. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, well, I would like to thank again uh, Federico for his presentation and of course all the authors uh, of the uh, manuscript, uh, David uh, Danson, Antonio Lioi, Igor Punsen, and Abel Rodriguez. I would like to thank uh, the, uh, I, <laughs> I would like to thank the um, um, discussants, um, Fernando uh, Quintana and Alejandro Hara who couldn't uh, come to the discussion. Uh, of course, Alessandra Guglielmi and Mario Beraha who participated in the discussion, and Vera Liu and Peter Mueller who also participated in the discussion. Um, the next uh, uh, webinar will probably be in, uh, for the March issue of Vision Analysis, and thanks, thanks everybody for uh, participating. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks.